even if you're not a spongiologist, and yes, that's in fact a real job, you should appreciate the ugly, inconspicuous sponges during your next diving trip, as they might contain valuable natural products like lysodendoric acid A, dubbed by some a potential anti-Parkinson's medicine. Why would a random Spongebob produce this complex thing? We'll get to that in a moment. Maybe you're thinking, hey man, the title says deals all the reaction, so where is the keying element in the molecule? Well, only the chemistry grand wizards will know that there is indeed an uber exotic deals alder hidden in this structure. In today's video, we will explore two truly extreme total syntheses, one of them featuring an insane quadruple deals alder cascade. This system was so hungry for deals alders that the authors literally had to stop it from going quintuple. We will cover basic and pretty advanced organic chemistry, offering a nice learning opportunity for everyone. So, no one should be dying today. To those of you unfamiliar with this type of seemingly random and pointless natural product research, it basically all starts with digging around in the sea for your specimen. Our sponges seem to like it particularly cold. After some marine dredging, aka playing Bob the Builder underwater, you grab your sponge and bring it to your trusted spongiologist to validate its authenticity. So, first big challenge, chopping. After this, you finally chop it up like Gordon Ramsay ordered you to, and then subject your mixture to a bunch of chromatographic separations. To the trained eye, this seems like an easy mode isolation compared to something ridiculous like ciguatoxin. Those chemists spent some fun weeks with four tons of moray eels and a bunch of blenders. To keep track of the trace toxin during the isolation steps, they simply checked which fraction killed their test mice. All of that work was rewarded with half a milligram of natural product. In comparison, cutting up 200 gram of frozen sponge and running some columns and HPLC seems like heaven. So after analyzing every fraction for unknown compounds, you eventually find a new gem like lysodendoric acid A. To characterize it, you try to draw as many NMR correlation arrows as humanly possible, run some mass spectrometry and so forth. This research also includes defining and more rarely testing hypotheses on biosynthetic origins of the product. Sometimes these include quite exotic reactions. The scheme here, we'll not go through it in detail, was actually drawn based on what's thought about the related natural product Manzamine A. This thing was first isolated in 1986 and it has since attracted the attention of chemists, but its biosynthetic origin is still a mystery four decades later. The original hypothesis by Baldwin had some experimental evidence behind it, but envisioned a multi-component condensation of different educts. These building blocks are a bit dubious to say the least. Acrolein is usually generated as a byproduct of catabolic processes and is rapidly metabolized to less toxic species. The supposed dialdehyde is extremely reactive and doesn't really have a biological function. Ammonia is obviously commonly encountered, however not in its free form. So, still in 2023, there are new suggestions to the first few steps of this biosynthetic cascade, including the postulation of free fatty acids as initial building blocks. This might be sensible because many different cousins of manzamine feature varying chain lengths and most commonly Z-alkenes, just like most unsaturated fatty acids. Like other toxins, it's actually not the sponge who produces manzamine. So these biosynthetic pathways occur in sponge-associated bacteria. For instance, researchers found a strain called M42 capable of producing manzamine A, however only in small quantities at a specific time early in the growth cycle. Behind this, there's likely a weird symbiotic relationship of sponges tapping into a chemical defense mechanism and in return offering a controlled habitat for bacteria to grow. The same phenomenon is behind more famous toxins like tetrodotoxin, which is synthesized by bacteria and only in a second step accumulated by pufferfish and friends. Okay, that's enough biology for today. The last step of every isolation is testing the natural product on a bazillion different potential properties. My favorite lackluster activity is the ability to kill amaranth and lettuce. Fortunately, lysodendoric acid A had more impressive effects in a validated in vitro model of Parkinson's disease. Here the molecule protected nerve cells from oxidative damage at very low concentrations. It's not a breakthrough by any means, but the hope is that this molecule could inform the understanding and design of future Parkinson's medicines. 
The value of the synthesis we will discuss today is not about easier access to these molecules, but rather due to the application of new chemistry. Retrosynthetically, there are several ways to deconstruct a target. If you have some good chemistry knowledge already, you can think about this problem for some minutes yourself. Drawing things on paper is much easier than finding what works in real life, so some of you might draw syntheses that are even simpler than what we will discuss. The approach we will cover centered on the deals older reaction of a cyclic allene? Most chemists know allenes from the time they got bombarded with name reactions to learn by heart. These species are useful for niche applications, I'm thinking of some freaky gold catalyzed rearrangement cascades here and indeed have also been employed in cycloadditions, typically 2 plus 2 or poisson kahn reactions. Cyclic allenes have also been known for decades, however most research is limited to obscure compounds like this one. Ironically this 10 membered ring allene can be made with the during la flamme synthesis, so do not forget to learn your name reactions and mechanisms. If you were wondering, this compound in particular was used to study some exotic mercury catalyzed rearrangements. The research at hand upped the ante by leveraging a strained six membered cyclic allene. The groundwork for this had been laid by the research group a few years ago already, as they identified suitable chiral silyl triflate and silyl bromide precursors, which upon treatment with cesium fluoride in acetonitrile generated highly stereospecific allenes. The strain energy is estimated to be in the ballpark of 30 kilocalories per mole, so even though they look ultra weird, they're actually less strained than benzene, for instance. Still they're highly reactive and axially chiral, so they were able to trap them in diastereoselective Diels-Alder reactions. The interesting thing is, we have two dienophilic groups. I never thought I would use this as an adjective. Using the typical electron-rich dye in furan, this addition is regioselective for the less substituted double bond with some erosion of enantiomeric excess. Regarding diastereoselectivity, note that the addition happens from the top phase, even though you might think that the methyl group is directing the selectivity. The reaction is also selective for the endo product as the CH and CO furan bonds are pointing to the same side. We will look at the transition state shortly to better explain this. This reaction is cool, but for the product to be synthetically useful for lysodendoric acid A, we require the opposite regioselectivity. A key insight here was that the use of an electron-poor pyrone diene gave the desired connectivity with even better EE. This selectivity is in line with what you would expect from an inverse electron demand diels alder with the more substituted dienophile being more reactive. You can check for yourself that it's still endoselective and that the diastereoselectivity is directed by the methyl group this time. The pyrone will be crucial for the total synthesis as we will see shortly. If you wonder why there's an erosion of EE, this comes from the racemization of the fleeting allene intermediate. Based on the substituent, the energetic barrier can be higher or lower, thus influencing the degree of EE transfer. You might say, bro, just use a normal olefin. Why are you overcomplicating things with the allene? Well, this is exactly what the authors tried initially through exhaustive screening, so opting for this quite exotic method was indeed justified. Let's check out how the total synthesis played out in full. The pyrondiene was first easily prepared from this commercial carboxylic acid. A double tosylation and esterification gave the activated tosylate, which was negishi coupled to a long alkyl rest. You will see that it bears a terminal alkene, which will ultimately be handy for the synthesis of the macrocycle. Note it differs from the model substrate we saw earlier, because that one had a benzylated hydroxy instead of the protected ester in this case. The allene precursor was a bit more challenging to synthesize. Analogous to the diene, a long alkyl rest was first introduced by treatment of the starting material bearing a sp2 triflate with a zirconium reagent and copper, with the bromide group chilling due to its lower reactivity. This alkyl rest will direct our allene cycle addition later on. To selectively introduce the silyl group required for the allene generation, three steps were needed. First, chirality was introduced through a CBS reduction of the carbonyl. After activation with ethyl chloroformate, the substitution with a silyl cuprate nucleophile gave the allene precursor, proceeding with perfect SN2 stereoinversion. 
For the Diels Alder reaction, they found that minus 20 degrees Celsius in a C2Night trial was the optimal temperature to maximize transfer of chirality. This required the use of tetrabutyl ammonium bromide as a phase transfer catalyst to increase the solubility of cesium fluoride required to trigger the aline formation. We've already covered that there are many different potential products. Impressively, the desired isomer was the sole observable product of this reaction. We've already indicated that the reaction follows endoselectivity. Here it might help to think of the non-reactive olefin at the aline as any other electron withdrawing group in a typical Diels-Alder. There is some overlap between the orbitals of the diene with that pi system, which again explains why the R1 group and the ester are syn in the product. The regioselectivity on the other hand can be explained by looking at the resonance structures of the educts. To complete the total synthesis, a concise late stage sequence was established. First, they had to get rid of the non reactive aline olefin. Because many conditions for this reduction did not work, they had to take a detour by first oxidizing the alpha amino carbon to the unsaturated lactam and then throwing a copper hydride on it. Here we should highlight the value of the pyrone Diels-Alder partner. Through the resulting CO2 bridge, the one free diene motif of lysodendoric acid is masked. It would be impossible to reduce the desired double bond selectively if it would be conjugated with the diene system as well. But after the bridge served its purpose, the team removed it via thermal decarboxylation, used a copper mediated bog protection to release the free nitrogen and appended another rest bearing a vinyl group. You probably now realize that an olefin metathesis reaction can link things up with the vinyl group which was chilling on the sidelines all along. Now, using a rhodium catalyzed reduction protocol, they were able to selectively target the imid while keeping the diene and ester groups intact. Last, acidic bog deprotection gave the product. With just shy of 1% overall yield, this will not pave the way for major medicinal investigations, but the methodology absolutely qualifies as an extreme reaction in my book. Did you catch a new insight or learning yet like SpongeBob during jellyfishing? If so, please show your support by liking, commenting and subscribing. A massive thanks goes to my channel members on Patreon and YouTube. Thank you for supporting my content. I'm super grateful for your encouragement and any comments or feedback you might have regarding future videos. Equally extreme as our first topic is our second one. The total synthesis of pedrolite. This natural product has no nice sponge story because it is a bit less exciting, originating from euphorbia plants. They are the sources of many, many terpenes with interesting bioactivities and structures. Following its isolation in 2021, this natural product was shown to inhibit P glycoprotein membrane transporters, which are connected to drug resistance of cancer cells. That's maybe cool, but nothing groundbreaking and definitely not as flashy as anti-Parkinson's activity. However, what this molecule lacks in function, it makes up in complexity. The extreme deals all the reaction in question is critical to assemble this impressive structure. But similar to lysodendoric acid A, we have to ask ourselves, where could we envision a deals all the retron? Obviously we should start to look at the six membered rings in the structure and understand if we can reverse engineer a cyclohexene motif somewhere. The left part is particularly inviting because it's highly interconnected. Let's assume that the alpha methyl ketone could be synthesized from the corresponding double bond and voila, we have a cyclohexene. If we break apart the ring, we realize that this would be, in contrast to lysodendoric acid, a normal electron demand deals all the reaction based on cyclopentadiene and an alpha beta unsaturated lactone as an electron poor dienophile. This confirmation might look weird, but redrawing helps to clarify. How can we embed the two deals all the educts into the molecule? Let's take the dienophile. The unsaturation might originate from an elimination reaction. This approach is smart because it simplifies the linear chain's introduction earlier in the synthesis as we will see later. The simplest disconnection of a lactone is simply an intramolecular lactonization requiring a free hydroxyl and the carboxylic acid. What about the diene? It's great out here as it was not used in the actual synthesis like this. That's because we need some tricks up our sleeve to make chemistry with this group. On one hand, cyclopentadiene is really reactive. Why? First, due to its cyclic nature, it's permanently locked in the S-cis conformation required for the concerted Diels-Alder mechanism. 
Second, a lower distortion energy required to reach the transition state geometry makes it also more reactive than other rings such as cyclohexene. However, this high reactivity also comes with unproductive isomerization through sigmatropic hydrogen shifts, dimerizations and other reactions. Here you can see a synthetic study which exemplifies this nicely. The chemists found that their original cyclopentadiene isomerized in situ leading to a quite different product than what they envisioned. Even though we might expect the more substituted isomer to be most stable, we can always have curtain hamid situations which mess up our plan. This high reactivity needs to be tamed, so cyclopentadienes need to be masked throughout the synthesis and unveiled only immediately prior to their use. Although other masking groups were considered, norbornadiene was used as a surrogate in the synthesis due to its stability and mild release conditions. You will understand this once we check out the cascade in detail. Another benefit of norbornadiene is that it can be introduced with a nucleophilic addition to the carbonyl. To break down the intermediate further, we can assume that the carboxylic acid could come from oxidation of the primary alcohol and that the whole side chain can be appended to the six-membered ring through enolate chemistry. This enoct does have a dimethyl cyclopropane group which is present in many commercially available terpenes, so you might think that the synthesis taps into nature's chiral pool. But due to the specific functionalization pattern, the chemists instead assembled the thing bottom up. It all starts with the oxidative de-aromatization of 4-methoxyphenol. The chiral methyl group was then introduced through a conjugate addition with enantioselectivity directed by the well-known phosphoramidide ferring ligand. Then a rubotum oxidation through the silyl enol ether introduced an alpha hydroxyl group. So we've started to decorate our central six-membered core, but what about the dimethyl cyclopropane? First the necessary carbons were introduced through a Grignard reaction with the ketone. There was a good diesterioselectivity for the desired antidiol, likely through the adjacent hydroxy group which directs the addition from the same side. Also note that because a normal Grignard reagent was used, 1,2 addition was preferred as opposed to conjugate 1,4 addition. Next the dimethyl acetal was hydrolyzed as we will need the ketone shortly and the diol was protected with test groups. To forge the cyclopropane the newly introduced isoprene unit was reduced and coupled through a 1,4 addition this time. It's quite impressive that even though the olefin is not activated this reaction proceeds in very high yield. Alright so next up we have to work through what we previously simplified as enolate chemistry. As the authors describe, initial attempts at sidechain installation with LDA or lithium HMDS resulted in low yields. However, doing it in an indirect manner worked much better, first converting the ketone to the TMS enol ether, then generating the lithium enolate by exchange with methyl lithium, and only after that running an aldol reaction with this aldehyde, bearing the full sidechain. Here we can see the random nature of experimental chemistry. Because the free beta hydroxy group was unstable, an immediate silylation was used to protect the product. This worked well at small scales, but with increasing quantities, the protection was more and more sluggish. For whatever reason, running the reaction at 2 millimole scale led to no silylation at all. Things like this just make your blood boil. Next up, they performed the nucleophilic addition of the norbornadiene organolithium. In the literature, this group had previously only been added to more reactive aldehydes, so it was quite likely a relief to see that the more hindered ketone and potential epimerization were not problems. To recap, this group is the masked, stabilized version of the cyclopentadiene we need for our deal solder. As a second step, the silyl protecting groups were removed by controlled treatment with TBAF. Note that this does not touch the triethyl silyl ethers, as we will see at the end, these groups need some more forcing conditions. Next up we have two steps in one. Oxidation of the primary alcohol to the acid with tempo and hypervalent iodine led, after some more stirring, for a total of 36 hours, directly to the lactone. Finally, the elimination of the beta hydroxy group via methylation and heating gave the dienophile for our deals all the reaction. Even though the upcoming reaction is quite complex, the setup seems pretty simple. The final conditions, check out the supporting information for more details, were 6 day long small scale reactions with a sub stoichiometric amount of a tetrazine trigger, giving the best yield based on recovered starting material. 
But what's the mechanism? First, we have unmasking of the cyclopentadiene. This works for an inverse electron demand deals alder addition of tetrazine to norbornadiene and subsequent nitrogen release through a retro deals alder. This provides for a strong driving force. And as DJ Khaled would like to say, another one. A second retro alder reaction kicks out an aromatic pyridazine, fully demasking the cyclopentadiene. Again, I recommend the nerds to read the SI as they nicely describe that the reactivity of tetrazines had to be well balanced. Electron poor tetrazines reacted rapidly in the first step, but failed to ultimately fragment and release the pyridazine and cyclopentadiene. After uncovering the beast, the fourth deals all the reaction with the unsaturated lactone gives the product which we initially envisioned in our retrosynthetic analysis. You may wonder, why would we opt for substoichiometric amounts of trigger? The final product has a double bond and guess what? This thing just doesn't want to stop deals aldering. Too much free tetrazine left over leads to a competitive decomposition of the product. Alright, let's finish this thing. You probably remember that we want an alpha methyl ketone in the end. We can get there by an epoxidation and subsequent methyl addition with a Gilman reagent. The regioselectivity was thankfully controlled by disfavored 1-free diaxial interactions between the methyl groups. This means the nucleophile adds to the more distant desired position and does so from the bottom phase where its trajectory is not blocked by the big carbon bridge. If you think this seems simple, don't fool yourself, very precise reagent control was needed to not mess things up. The resulting alcohol was oxidized to the ketone present in the natural product and the protecting groups were fluorinated away. Now it's just two different esters to be introduced at the alcohols. Interestingly, the isopropyl ester proved more reactive as a reaction with 11 equivalents of activated agent led to 43% of tertiary esterification and 26% of secondary esterification. Finally, another large dump of anhydride and careful purification from the excess reagents delivered the final product. What a ride! We started with diving for sponges and ended in hardcore organic chemistry. I must say, I'm personally a bit dying myself after compiling this video. I hope you liked it and were to follow or at least learn some new things regardless of your level of synthesis expertise. Once again, thanks so much for watching and supporting my videos. As always, until next time.